Do de do de do. Hey folks, setting up. Mm, how is everyone? Could you work up my tea? I need it tonight. Ah, now I remember. I arrange my OBS windows in a certain way every time and I wonder why I didn't move it to this screen but now I realize because when I have it on this screen I end up looking down that's why I prefer it up here then I'm looking more towards the camera now I remember why I put it there Let's see. Uh, what are we getting? A bit wise, we're looking good. Not seeing anything online yet. Uh, that's strange. Why does it think I'm offline still? Curious. Have a quick look. Bear with my friends. Let us see. That seemed to be live, so why don't my stats show that? That's very interesting. Right, okay, so as far as I'm concerned, it's rolling. Get my notes up. This is going to be important. I'm going to need that. In fact, this is very small today. Wow, tiny, tiny, tiny. Let me just check a couple of things. Check my levels. They seem to be okay, which is good. We're ready to rock and roll. Good evening, everyone. I need my tea tonight. It's been one of those weeks. I just feel exhausted this week for some reason. It's not like I've been highly productive. But, um, maybe it's just being in autumn. Who knows? What am I going to talk about today? Let's let's just consult my notes. Uh, what have we had going on community-wise? Um, there isn't that much news actually, but I noticed there's a new version of Circuit Python. Let me just have a quick look. Let's see if I can see anything on that. Bear with me. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this was mainly just changes, uh, bug fixes, etc. I'm not sure anything new was added. Hold on. 
was the last commits? Uh, yeah. Let's have a look at the tags. That might give you a clue. 6.0. Right, yeah, so Circuit Python is now version 6 of Circuit Python is now beta 2. Um, I can probably share this actually. Hold on. Uh, can we add a browser? There we go. Make it a bit smaller. Do, 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 do. I don't think much of this makes any real difference to oh, this window's massive. We just got to downsize this somewhat. So, beta 2, what does it say here? Mainly quick bug fix of beta 1. Um, is there any new support? RGB matrix? No. Quite a few language changes. I2S slave is now an I2C peripheral. Some changes there. Default speed of I2C. Very little else that's new. Okay. Nothing much to report on there. So there's not been anything really new uh, on the forum. Evening Ed, by the way. Um, what's I saying? Evening. Miracle of Twitch subscription. I got an email to remind me. Oh, that's good, Ed. Uh, they're a bit low, are they, my audio levels? They don't actually look low. Are you sure, Ed? Maybe it's just me mumbling. So if I'm speaking normally, is this this level okay? Uh, I'm in the green, bumping into the yellow, but not really into the red. Uh, I just must stop mumbling, Ed, I think. Um... So, nothing really new uh, on the forum side of things. What have I been doing this week? What have I been working on? I actually done anything. I have done something. Um, the current state of alloy is as kind of um, oscillated a little bit. 
maybe maybe let me just cover that quickly because that's quite a quick one to do um or should we do tiles first Ooh, um hmm. let me just switch to the cad view we go oh that's strange why have I got I got two windows open I think I have that's very interesting let me just check something folks what window is that? Oh, come on, let me open it. It's meant to be this schematic. It's chosen the wrong one. Hold on. There we go. It's a bit better. Um, uh, so this is the tile. Let's I can switch back to this in a sec. There we go. Let me just switch to Alloy. Yes, just going to save those changes for me. Um, okay, so this is just showing as it was last week. So one of the things that I was doing last week was I was experimenting with uh, squishing things back up to the basic feather type uh, pin out with no extra pins um, but I've had a long hard think about this and I'm going to go back to how it was in terms of adding in um, the older oh, sorry the longer ports let me um, I've got all sorts plugged in here. I'm going to have to sort my wires out. Now, if you look at uh, the first build, the Rev 8, can you see how that extends a bit further? It's got the um, dual row connectors, then the P mod Oops. at the end, which I've in this diagram I've crushed that up and you, you've lost that so I'm, I'm going to resort back to that so what I was thinking was um, I could use the top row of pins can you see my cursor yes I wish to make it bigger um, I was thinking of putting the FPGA pins on there and then one down on the CD pin here that was the plan but what worried me about this is the I wasn't getting enough pins to be exposed uh, for the connectivity options that I want to do on, say, the carrier board that this feather may go in. Um, so I'm kind of resorting back to the, uh, the dimensions that it was before. Um, The FPGA pins will therefore be on the latter part, just like it is on the um, on the current prototype, the Rev A. So the Rev B is going to be a bit more like Rev A, actually. It's not going to be changed as radically in that sense. Um, what are the justifications for that? Is one I need more than sixteen. I'm actually going to try and expose 20 FPGA pins. Um, let me just switch back if I can to the very older one so that you can see what that looks like. So this is the old Rev A. So on the Rev A here you can see that we've got this extra 
this is a 16 pin connector that carries eight signals um, sorry 16 eight of which are shared with the P mod so on the new rev that I'm doing actually these headers extend along here to these two along here to these two um, these LEDs disappear because that's being replaced by an RGB LED and I'll come back to that when I switch back so this will go all the way down so that form so in basically these get extended by two the normal feather headers so they're two longer if you like two 0.1 inch headers longer and then in the center you have a two by seven now if you add all of that up you have 18 pins on the jewel roll at the end here effectively or 2 plus 14 plus 2 plus 1 for the um, the CD pin here which gives me all the pins I need to take on to um, the next door to board when I talk about tiles it might become a bit more apparent because I need a few more pins to do the tiles let me just switch back to the new one um, but not everything's going back some of the changes I've made I want to keep actually why is it saying that I need to I do need to keep that and open that so down here you see we've got this much smaller RGB LED which replaces the uh, three individual ones there's a bit more room as well there um, underneath I've got the um, stemmer type connector here for the I squared C as well which is kind of useful but the changes here on the left hand side near the USB is the smaller LED so I've got two of those two of the RGB LEDs uh, and then you probably couldn't see this on the last one but on the rear um, of the previous version uh, there are some spaces for something which I haven't populated on here actually. In between the FPC cam connector and the SD card, the footprint of a resistor array and a capacitor. That has now been brought onto the uh, top side and is now over here underneath the USB connector. Those are used to do two things. One is measure the battery voltage, three things, sorry. Measure the battery voltage. There's a potential divider there, low current potential divider, so I can measure the battery voltage. The second thing is there's an RC circuit in there, which is what uh, Adafruit use on their boards as a one bit memory to detect the difference between a power up reset and a normal reset and the other one is i've actually got an led on there for power um so that's what all of this is here so the power led is broken out here um we've still got the charge led there and we've got the rgb which is driven by the esp 32s2 um that can also be strangely enough driven by circuit python which brings me to one of the issues i've discovered that I've got to try and fix somehow. Normally, in most of the boards that uh, Adafruit are shipping and some others um, are shipping, they use the NeoPixel LEDs. So rather than having your regular blink, you have this NeoPixel LED. So the NeoPixel LED is a serial LED. Um, I never wrote alternative is the APA like 102s or something which are a kind of serial which is two data lines which is a clock and a data line um, I'm not particularly keen on those uh, I don't quite get what the benefit is when you're just driving like one of them sure if you're going to drive a lot of them then it makes sense to have them serially connected etc um, anyhow circuit python has support for the status LED built in so I did have a look and see if you were actually tied down I wanted to see what choices were because um, I didn't really want to go with either the NeoPixels or the APA 102s because there's a couple of issues with going that route 
cost obviously secondly is power consumption um, you can't easily switch them off per se because they have like uh, step downs and things in them so um, when I looked at the code I saw that there was actually a what happens is in circuit Python when you power up um, it shows you an ongoing status of the circuit Python um, supervisor effectively there's kind of a little supervisor that's taking a few cycles in the background and that will normally just be green when it boots up it goes through actually a couple of sequences so you can actually do things during that boot sequence so when the LED is a certain color I can't remember which like purple or blue or something press it you can actually put it into safe mode for example which is a, a good mode for debugging um, lower level issues in circuit Python but also if you run you know your code.py or whatever in circuit Python then the LED will normally um, show certain colors and may blink or may not blink etc and if there's a failure it will show a different color etc so having this LED type support color RGB LED type support is quite useful from a diagnostic point of view it also helps fit in with the standard so I figured it'd be a good idea if I could actually support that in some way um, but I didn't really want to use any pixels anyhow when I dug down I did find that there is some RGB code in the uh, circuit Python uh, supervisor part that, that there are effectively I think three different configuration types I think one is the APA XXX type driver one is the Neo Picture driver but there's another one which is basically just the PWM driver um, and the PWM driver um, will, will just drive a normal RGB LED uh, and in terms of um, taking cycles away from you um, both are very good because once you the only time it takes cycles is when you're actually changing the color so on the APAs and the NeoPixels you're only really using processor cycles when it's actually sending out a new uh, color status to the pixel uh, and likewise RGB is probably even less uh, overhead because what you're using is you're using the hardware PWM outputs effectively underneath so the only time you're really changing that is when you're setting the timing registers for the PWM matches or whatever theoretically however I couldn't get the damn thing to work Whenever I enable the PWM RGB support, uh, it won't boot. So uh, I've got to dig a bit deeper into that, and that may require me fixing Circuit Python. It's not something that uh, you know Scott or the Adafruit guys are particularly interested in fixing, because as I say, they don't really use regular RGB LEDs now. All of their known stuff has Neo Pixels on it, uh, and many of the others use APA type RGB LEDs rather than just a regular PWM. Um, so it looks like I'm going to have to work out what's going on there. I did have a brief look, I did step through the code, I couldn't see what the issue was. There was a suggestion that the PWM wasn't properly supported yet on the S2, but that's not true because I'm actually using. You know, pulse io .pwm in order to generate a clock signal among other things in my uh, test, te test, test code. So I know that's working in the version that I have here. So it's got to be something deeper about the way that that's working. Maybe the type of PWM that's being used. Anyhow, so I've got to look in deeper to that. But my plan is to have an RGB LED showing the status that follows the normal circuit Python color status chart and use the PWM support, albeit it will have to be a fixed version uh, of that. So I've got to dig into that later in the week. I must not forget to, um, to do that. Um, one of the other good things about having a PWM RGB is you can actually do blinky and stuff. 
you know, one of the things that I was really annoyed about with the Kaluga one board was there wasn't a single LED on there that you could do blink with. I mean, what kind of development board doesn't give you an LED that you can blink? You know, in other words, you have to use a library in order to talk to the NeoPixel in order to get, you know, something happening. You know, when you're just picking up a new board, doing blink is just like number one, right? You know, you just want to do something very basic. So that's a bit surprising. Um, so with the RGB LED, you can do that. You know, you can blink one of the LEDs. It's not a problem. And you can actually override uh, the, um, the status, circuit Python status, i.e. temporarily take control of the LED. Anyhow, that's that. Um, anything else on the circuit Python side? Don't think so. I think that's that on that side. As I say with the CAD, oh, the other thing I'm doing in order to support um, the RGB LED, I'm, I've juggled around which IOs I'm using. Excuse me, which IOs I'm using on the um, uh, to drive things like the RGB LED and the one bit memory use of the VBAT. So I'm using more signals um, than I was before. Um, one of the things that I'm also doing in order to get the extra FPGA signals is I'm confining it now to uh, quad SPI. I'm not going to bother with the Octo SPI. There's issues getting that operational anyhow, particularly within circuit piping. So I've now got enough LED, uh, enough pins that I can support the functionality that I need. Uh, and I may juggle about which pins are being used where. There's a couple of other fixes. The UART needed fixing the RX and TX were uh, using badly chosen pins, so I fixed that. And um, what was the other thing? I believe that the um, or I believe that I can have included in the uh, Ferra header IO pins um, the JTAG pins before the JTAG pins were which are mucks with just regular pins um, were going to be used with the Octo spike so in freeing those, I can actually expose those, which might be useful. So that's that really. I think that's all the changes on the alloy front. I've got um, a little bit of um, improvement to do. Uh, I was going to replace these two SOD123 diodes with a single uh, BAS type. Uh, drop B. However, the ones that I was going to get for this are now out of stock, I notice, so I may have trouble getting those. And I had trouble finding the right uh, diode because they need to be like half an amp uh, shot piece uh, in a SOT23 package, which is. Um, it's probably difficult, but there are there are some there. I found an NXP one actually, a PME six thousand something or other. Uh, but they've just gone out of stock, so I may have to go and find another one of those. So I may hold off on that one. Um, so that's that. I've also got to change the SD card. If I want the stemmer connector on the bottom, I need to go for a slightly smaller SD card. I found a couple of candidates on LCSC that are very low cost. That are smaller, so I might need to change that as well. Um, that brings us up to date with the hardware changes on the CAD. I don't think. Just check the circuit. Just make sure I'm not missing anything here. Oh, I might add a delay to the 3 volt free bring up, although it's not causing any issues at the moment. 
um, just so that the one volt, the VCC for the F FPGA comes up a bit quicker. Um, I might also make the pads on the um, up 5k chip slightly longer so they poke up a bit more. It was really tight getting that um, soldered in. Uh, and the reflow could have been better. I think it's a bit tight. It's like manufacturing tight rather than kind of prototyping tight. And I do again need to check the pads because they seem to be slightly larger than I prefer on the 0402s. Um, I did have a lot of tom tombstoning on the um, reflow for this one. So I'd like to uh, sort that out a bit. Right, so. Um, the other thing I'm going to talk about a bit later with Alloy is the N-Mijin stuff. And I'm going to just step through, because I've got to create uh, N-Mijin support for it. Um, and we can do that live. But before that, the other thing I just wanted to bring up, um, let me just open this. One of the things I'm working on is a thing called tiles. So... I want I want let me show you example tile to show you a peek of this so this is a tile what is a tile so a tile is a um, expansion board that follows the tile standard and tiles fit into a tile carrier of some sort um they're not much more sophisticated than a d double p mod in terms of io there is an optional two extra pins um two fpga ios available that i'm reserving at this point in time for that so it would be 10 as opposed to eight ios um but i may reserve that i still deciding on that front and um there is an extra uh enable pin although you can you'll be able to find that on the mx um mix mods as well but you won't get the extra two pins so what is the point what's it for so it's about mechanical stability so the way that these go together is uh, so if we look at this tile here the connector here let me just get this um, we don't actually need this chip let's let me just kill this off so I need to fix this anyhow and So if we look, it's homing for a sec, the connector there is actually underneath, it's on the bottom layer. This is a surface mount, uh, two row by eight, 0 0.1 inch male header, and that will be pointing down. So it's mounted on the base of the board, pointing down. You can also have a free hole, through hole version of this. So my... Um, template if you like for a tile has both an SMD and a through hole variant so that's the low voltage logical section if you like um, the other thing that you'll notice with this um, forgive the positioning of this because that's actually wrong now that probably going to need to go there I'll come back to that so if we look at these big these three big pads and they are pads they're not just screw holes so what those do is one is for ground which complies with the logic side in terms of voltage the other two on the right hand side of the board v plus at the top v minus at the bottom these are the power feeds for the board now the power 
comes into the board from the carrier below using uh, either nickel or brass spacers, which are highly conductive. And uh, the board is literally fitted and then can be screwed down. So it, it has a very high current carrying capacity if needed. Now, not everything that goes onto a tile is going to be high current, but there are a number of applications in particular where it's really useful to be able to have uh, very low impedance, low resistance feeds of um, uh, either higher voltage or higher current or both combinations. Um, the other advantage of this arrangement here is because you've got a three point um, harness effectively, something that is physically screwed down, it's very solid. When you're doing, you know, work on automation, for example, you need to, you know, if you're dealing with things like motors and such, uh, you, you, you can experience all sorts of mechanical issues like vibration, etc. Um, P-Mods are great, but they are mechanically useless. Um, they are feeble. They, uh, they can be wobbly. Um, let me show you an example. So, yeah, if we look at this one. So I've got a carrier here. Um, one that you may not be familiar with. It's, it's an educational carrier uh, for the ice core. But the problem here is stability. It's just rubbish. P mods are just not mechanically good. Electrically, they're kind of okay, but mechanically, they suck, quite frankly. So if you're doing anything that involves things like motors and automation, maybe you're going into harsher environments, you need something that is mechanically uh, more robust. So um, tiles uh, can give you that robustness. So what you can actually do is you can build a stacked frame, you know, um, the basic tile idea is you have a carrier and then you have tiles that fit in, however many tiles that might be. Um, I do have a design that has a kind of sandwich whereby you have a carrier and you have tiles that can fit on top and tiles that fit on the bottom. That is why we have an offset between the V plus and the V minus. So it can be flipped to the underside. And you can separate the voltages. Otherwise, you'd have a short between your V plus and your V minus if they had the same uh, horizontal um, coordinates um, in this diagram. Um, so the tile format itself is much more robust mechanically. It's more sound. Has some enhancements over P mods. It's a mixed signal connection. Uh, I'll show you the connectors in a sec. And um, it can deal with higher voltages and it can deal with higher currents, etc. That's really useful when you're doing things like um, motors, for example. If you're doing CNC control systems or something, if you're doing robotics, perhaps, if you're delivering power somehow. So, one of the projects that uh, I work on is a um, a smart power system um, for um, developing developing nation applications whereby low uh, relatively low voltage up to about 50 volts DC is generated um, normally through solar which is then um, we then use MPPTs for example to do efficient conversion um, probably down to about 30, 36 volts or something. Uh, and then that gets distributed um, over cabling, which can be up to a kilometre 
and can also carry um, uh, low bandwidth Ethernet, for example. So you could think of it as a kind of um, uh, PoE on steroids, but with an emphasis more on power than bandwidth. You wouldn't be doing gigabit over it, for example, because the runs are too long, the cable runs are too long. So um, that that's one example. You could use it as a lighting rig, for example. So each tile could support any number of lighting rings for LEDs. Um, you could use it as a power distribution for things like caravans, boats, trailer homes, trailer parks. You could use it, you know, to power camping sites and things like that. There's all sorts of different places where this kind of design can work, but primarily because it doesn't just carry the power, but it, it can it can actually carry communication as well along the same cabling. Um, so that's kind of handy. Um, another place you might be using it, you could just build yourself a PoE for your house, you know, a more robust PoE. Um, so that's a bit of fun. Uh, and again, it leans on the FPGA to do the uh, the hard data bits of that. Um, the other the other obvious uses for motor control in robotics, etc. So um, in this case here, if you're looking at this particular tile, what this tile does is it provides a free access uh, controller for things like CNCs, uh, plotters. Um, maybe 3D printers, etc. Uh, and because you could have multiple tiles, you could have any number of axes that you may require. Um, so this will drive, in this case, this is a stepper, both, stepper motor based uh, controller using the Trinamic um, stepper controller chips um, along with uh, end stop support, etc. I've got some work that I've got to do on that. So I've got an interesting idea. This may make a really good um, project to show what's possible using the Python down type approach uh, that I've mentioned in previous um, previous streams. We can come back around to that if you like. So um, if we look at the pinouts, it's probably a good idea. So let me see if I can bring up. So this is what a tile looks like from a schematic point of view. This is actually wrong now because I've just changed this. So one of the things that I've got to do is actually change this back. So at one point I had eight data lines. And... I also had a serial uh, connection on there. Now the trouble with doing that is it is it ties down this serial connection where I could be using it for more generic pins. So that is when I started thinking about rather than using D1 up to D8, I actually go you know up to 10 IOs. That enables me to turn any any of those into things like I squared C if I want or SPI, etc. It gives me a bit more flexibility. And I think 10 is a good number for that. Um, but one of the things I was considering was if I was to do that, um, how would that look? So let me just rename this because enables another really useful one. But let me just change this around because I'm just going to put this. Um, let me just call this T uh, zero for now. And I'm going to call this D minus one. Going to be odd. Let me, put, let me do that. Yeah, just temporarily for the moment. Then the this one should probably be one of the possibilities was that I could make this uh, 
Ah, okay. Make that. I can make this. Uh, Three volt three and this um, ground. Here. So I'd have ten IOs and then this one of the reasons for considering this design. Let me just pull it up because you probably can't see that yet. Bear with me. Piece of my up somewhere. Hold on, window capture, uh, library. I do apologise, folks, for not showing you this when I'm talking about it. it would be helpful. There we go. So one of the advantages of doing it this way round in terms of pinout, so I know I'm starting at D minus one here, it's just because I can't be bothered to renumber them just for the moment. So I've effectively got ten. And then I've got free volt and ground here. One of the reasons for doing it this way is if you can imagine this lower section. In fact, let me just change it just slightly. Uh, I want to make Damn it. I'm going to make this. Uh, So I need some feedback on this, by the way, guys. It's an idea that I may actually dump for the simple reason that I'm not sure it achieves what I'd like it to achieve in terms of the choice of pins here. I will do the tiles because the tiles is important. So on this pin out here, I hope that you can see this clearly enough. Let me know, Ed, if you can't read the um, labels on here. So if we look at this, let's pretend that D1 and D0 for the moment are NC or reserved. Okay, to be replaced by digital. What I'm kind of doing with the pin out here is I'm making it effectively compatible with half of a mix mod. Um, which may or may make it easier. And I'm not sure whether it's worth chasing that particular idea. Primarily because the physical format. So on a carrier, these will look, these will use. These type of connectors which are, this is a through hole um, version, two rows of eight. I don't think I've got the SMG version handy. So these will be on the carrier pointing up or on the bottom of the carrier pointing down. They're not right angle connection like P mods or mix mods. So if you wanted to use it say as a P mod, I know this is a wrong type of connector. You'd end up having to do 
something like that. I you'd need some sort of a adapter because what you couldn't do well I mean you could but it would be nuts is um, stick the P mod in vertically because it would just be stuck up like a tree I mean we already know how unstable those are you know having it stuck in the bore vertically yeah sure you could plug your P mod in but it's going to be a heck of a physical compromise so is it worth supporting that usage when in reality it's it's just not very practical so let me know your thoughts on that um so in other words what i'm saying is is there any point in chasing um p mod Ooh, half mix mod um, compatibility. The other issue that puts a spanner in the works there is the pitch of these new tiles, the distance between them will not match up with P mods. So if you've got a P mod that's a, like a quad P mod, i.e., two doubles. There's a standard spacing between those two, and that's not going to be the same as the tile spacing. So in that case, you'd have to use some sort of uh, PCB type adapter that converts two tiles into a double P mod support, and that's that's quite feasible. But if you're going to do that anyhow, this backward compatibility is pointless. It doesn't really buy you anything. The only thing it will buy you is being able to stick a p-mod in vertically a single or double p-mod so it's debatable whether it's worth actually maintaining any pinout compatibility because if i don't have to have pinout compatibility i can add in i can do something more useful so, for example, the ground on here is surplus to requirement because I've already got a ground connection that's used for the screw, which is much better. Um, so I could use that for something more useful. Um, I could also rearrange the pins in a different way. So I have ground and free volt here and then uh, D0 and D1 here and then that goes up to D9 or 10 rather uh, which is just a bit more logical um, so I'll be interested in your thoughts in there let me know in the chat um, if you've got feedback about that because the pinout is not yet designated yes I've done some tile work before but I've literally thrown that away because I know I'm going to have to change. Because the other thing that I've changed, I may have briefly shown the tile um, on the last stream, but I've made the tile smaller. I thought they were a little too big last time. And when you come to put them on boards, uh, it's a good idea to have them smaller. You can actually fit more on, for example with less PCB space uh, and that has some advantages the other size was perhaps overkill I've kept the edge dimension the contact facing edge dimension for the outputs because that's one of the other benefits that the P mods provide is they've got a wide number a wide area that can be used as output because one of the big problems you have with any of these is getting enough room to fit all your IO connections on for things like your motor connectors or you know your network connectors or something like that it takes up a lot of space so the dimension has been in in this particular uh example sorry uh here we go again let me turn the light uh, apologies you can't actually see what's happening it's always a good idea to do that. 
So the dimensions here are the same from top to bottom, i.e. the height. It's from left to right or right to left where I have shaved off some of the uh, some of the excess uh, space. So I'm going to do some work with that. Anyhow, so that's I, I'll, I'll probably put one of these on my next PCB order when I've got the alloy changes done. I'll, I'll probably add in. Um, maybe one of these boards to drive some like a triple axis because that, that will make a good circuit python well not circuit python that will make a good you know python down type project um, so let me save this let me show you what the old tile carrier looked like that i um developed or designed for um black ice I can find it. Uh, oh, why can't I see that? That's annoying. There we go. So this design was based around uh, actually black ice but ice core so effectively what you have down here in the center is the ice core board and then around it you have effectively five tiles but this is the tiles with the older dimension uh, which was a 50 by 50 um, now the tiles aren't because they're kind of 90 degrees to the one that you were just looking at I'm afraid it's to make things complicated so um, it's changed since then um, so one of the things I thought that I might do as well in order to, to do a quick test with these is if I can get it done in time with the alloy changes is I could do a kind of um, a breakout board like this hold on so this is just a rough um, layout of a breakout board. So in this example here, this uses the new tile size. So I have the alloy in the center. Uh, in fact, where it has the P mod there, that's now goes all the way across. So that's more like, let me draw this properly. So let's just add that in. Watch it in quickly so you can see. I didn't want to do that. Come on. Because I've just saved some changes on here, that's fine. Uh, let's just do this. Uh, let's do, what do we want? Something like that. So rather than that being like that, it's kind of going to be like that. And I may have to alter some sizes, etc. So the alloy would fit here. I need to make this slightly taller. And We have a tile either side facing outwards, i.e. with the connectors on the right hand side and the left hand side. So this would be great for just evaluating 
and testing the tile idea. It's just a nice quick way using alloy rather than going the full blown route using a tile board. Something else that I could add in here as well is at the top, I could easily add in if I wished um, an MX connector, just like I did on the previous. Um, When I made the uh, previous Reve of the uh, alloy, I also made one of these for the breakout, which I still haven't used yet, haven't populated. This will need to change slightly now with the new board. So I wish it would focus. There we go. So on here, at the top, is a mix mod connector, which I could also add up here so I could have a breakout board that supports either mix mod or tiles which might be kind of cool and it could get the uh, tile thing started anyhow let me know your thoughts folks Right, um, so that's tiles. Any questions on tiles, by the way? Please fire away if you've got any questions. Um, what have I not covered on that front? Does everybody kind of get what that is, tiles, and what the idea is behind that? Um, It's entirely possible that I could do a board that was just tile. So, for example, uh, here I'm using alloy to kind of just just do a test. It's also a good daughter board that could be um, available to go with alloy. But um, if I do a dedicated board for tiles, um, I could... For example, support a larger number of tiles. I could go up to say on an alloy style ice 45k style board, I could go up to probably three tiles. If I only supported the eight pins, I think I actually got to four, but that's probably pushing it, quite frankly. I'd probably be better off using three tiles. Um, the other thing, um, I do have tile uh, ideas as a tile carrier for the, you know, a black edge tile carrier. So the one that I showed you just now, like a, a newer version of that that supports these newer, newer ideas of tiles is slightly smaller tiles. A black edge board could easily support six of those, maybe more. In fact, the limiting factor is likely to be the uh, mix signal pins. Um, at the moment, I've got three mix signals pins on a tile, but that could be two mix signals and one just GPIO. Uh, if I go that route, then theoretically, I could do a lot more tiles. Um, you know, you could have a board that was sandwich like and have kind of four on the top, four on the bottom. Entirely possible. So you'd have a very powerful subsystem there that was very mechanically sound, and that would be great for really complex robotics type apps applications for example um, particularly if we were using something like the uh, um, the amalgam i.e the coming ecp5 uh, black edge board um, you could do some very powerful stuff with that Okay, so um, 
if you have any questions file them away on that so what I'm probably going to look at now is let's take a look at nmigen um, I don't know if I've covered nmigen before I've probably mentioned it but I may not have talked about it nmigen is um, a new version of mygen effectively now mygen which was based on or stemmed from my HDL uh, and mygen is also used in litex which is another thing that you may have heard of even if you haven't heard of mygen is a python based um, if you like a hardware description uh, um, I wouldn't say language uh, domain specific language perhaps DSL for want of a better term um, there were some limitations although I mean there's a re it's really good peripheral support out there for my gen, particularly in litex so if you're going the SOC route it is very well equipped however there were issues with the underlying um, um, mygen uh, DSL in the way that it described the hardware um, it had some uh, you know mental impedance issues if you like with it basically tried to model existing Verilog in many ways or VHDLs um, and mygen is probably much better equipped for describing things uh, within Python and they're all Python based basically so nmigen I don't I don't know what the n stands for new perhaps like new mygen perhaps I don't know the exact story um, behind that but anyhow nmigen enables one to uh, describe the hardware using this um, domain specific language um, actually inside Python along with all the Python goodies so one of the you know the multi-tier Python you know starting at the top and working your way down with orchestration and model at the top and then optimization going down the whole idea of doing this and being able to do it in one language i.e. Python um, means you've kind of got a unified uh, language approach albeit with slightly different models so on the von Neumann side of the equation you've got MicroPython or CircuitPython uh, initially I'm using CircuitPython here because I'm using the ESP32 S2 chip uh, and MicroPython support for that is forthcoming um, CircuitPython is more advanced in that sense it's you know Scott was briefed to bring that up in uh, you know version 6 of CircuitPython so he's done a lot of work on that um, there's a bit more distance when it comes to getting micro Python support for the S2 so that's why I'm using circuit Python but long term I'd like to use both but both are Python based and circuit Python includes micro Python albeit an older version uh, circuit Python is kind of a fork of MicroPython, but it's more, it kind of includes MicroPython. Although, as I say, it's the previous version right now, not the new version. The new features like async, IO, etc., are not supported in Python. Um, and as Laurie has brought up before, you know, unlike uh, MicroPython, dealing with uh, multiple tasks and processes. 
uh, the support isn't there, concurrency support isn't there, etc. But anyhow, just putting that to one side, we have a Python mechanism for the top down on the von Neumann part of the equation. And then we can also get a, a, a Python DSL actually used to design our logic, you know, outputting effectively HDL um, to program our FPGA chips to do what we like. So we have this, we then have this lovely top down approach where you can rapidly prototype in Python and then you can start adding layers of optimization moving some of that functionality down into the FPGA hardware for example and or moving some of the Python stuff, the von Neumann Python stuff into C if you need to. MicroPython leans heavily on having C drivers it's not using Python for the low level stuff most of the time it's, it's calling on pre-compiled C libraries to do a lot of that work and it's leaning heavily on the peripherals in the device in the microcontrollers for example and we'd be leaning heavily on the HDL described logical parts that are existing and being burnt into the uh, FPGAs. But the cool thing is you can start at Python at the top and then you can design everything you need within the Python environment. And you can control it from Python as well. So that's kind of the story really of using MMIGEN. The other thing that MMIGEN does, by the way, underneath is it talks directly to uh the objects the um interfaces the code interfaces and apis i don't know if they're officially apis but it's kind of, there are apis inside yosis for example so it can do some fairly smart stuff it doesn't have to go out to verilog and then uh to um the internal model that Yosis uses it, it can bridge that gap directly, which gives it some advantages that Mygen didn't have. However, it is still does have some limitations. Um, you know, you may have to drop into Verilog occasionally, but uh, you can do that fairly easily in Mygen. So it's, it's not a huge issue. Now, in order to use Mygen, you have to um, you have to write some software. So let me um, let me open this up. So if I can share a window, because we need to put this together. Wow, that's not what I wanted happening. I didn't want that to happen. Come on, bring up my editor. Now I'm going to work from where I was last working on Nmigen stuff. I'm not entirely sure what the state of this is. So we could have a little bit of fun with that. Um, and the last time I was using this was to do... Uh, I was trying to build um, Ice Core and Black Ice MX support for Nmigen. So I'm going to kind of bring the environment up that I was using for that and then we can um, start creating the alloy environment. So I haven't shared this yet on OBS so I need to just briefly set this up. So I'm going to have to just quickly mess with um, the interfaces here because they're not. Come on, ice core. Show me, show me, show me, show me ice core. Let me just kill editor tabs. And split. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, right. C 
So oh, let me. It's complaining. It always does this when it starts up. Yes, I don't want to give you feedback. Thank you very much. I need to get my environment visible. So this is going to be a bit of fun, making this fit in. Bear with me. Let me try and share this window briefly. Um, let me add in. Okay. Okay. Whew. Uh, this is a bit big. Can I reduce this down maybe? Let me see what I can fit in the screen. Hold on. Forgive me, I'm squeezing stuff down a bit here so it fits in. Uh, I'm probably going to need to um, increase the size. Guys, that's probably too small, isn't it? Let me just increase the font size here. Ooh, let me remember where that is. Font size. Let's go up to 20. Apply. Uh, and then editor. Empty. Okay. Okay. How's that look, guys? Can you read that, Ed? Can you read that? All right. I don't know if you're paying attention, or Laurie, or anyone. Mm. Found a chip. It's an old one. What it's doing here it must have fallen out or something. Is that still too small, Ed? I can take it up. Let me just increase it a bit more. Hold on. Thanks, sorry. Uh, let's take it up to 24, shall we? And same for the console. Sorry, I've got a very high res screen here. <laughs> I get used to using um, quite small um, font sizes. How's that, guys? Ed, better? Can you read that yet? But still too small, Ed, or not? <clears throat> okay, I'm going to start on. Let me know, Ed. That's now okay in full screen, but in full screen, I can't chat. <laughs> well, uh, how does the chat work? Does it sit underneath? Can you can you move the chat? Does it, I can't remember if the chat breaks out. Does the chat break out? I know in um, some of the streaming services you can break the chat out so it's a separate window so you can actually overlay it on top of the others and stuff. Just about okay in theatre mode. Mm, theatre mode. <laughs> 
Okay, I'll carry on. If, if you get really frustrated, let me know. I can increase it. How many characters have we got here? Uh, should, I might, might be able to take it up a little bit further. Um, trouble is, these files are slightly wider. Let me just notch it up one more little, one more little bit, shall I? Hopefully this doesn't go ridiculous. Woo! How's about that? That's huge. God, it's knocking me out. It's so big, I'm tripping over the letters, man. So anyhow, let's have a look at the anatomy. So um, I'm going to start. Is, is my audio going? It seems to be. I seem to be redlining more now. I'm not getting any echo, am I? Um, this. Okay. So what you have to do if you want to add board support to Nmigen, um, there is a separate repository from nmigen called uh, nmigen boards I think it is hold on should have it open here is that right? that's nmigen sorry I've got a lot of shit open here yeah, look nmigen boards this one yeah it doesn't increase the size of that font sorry Ed. anyhow so there's a separate repo for the boards um, so I recently did uh, an Nmigen board file, which is a Python file, funny enough, um, for Ice Core and Black Ice MX. And the way I did it is, I did start off writing the Black Ice MX and then I realized how stupid that was. I do the Ice Core one which basically covers you know an ice core board come on focus that's the bit without the carrier and that's probably the most complicated bit in many ways but then when you put it on a carrier you're adding functionality in terms of p mods etc right so um what i do is i design the ice core board driver and then i actually just refer to that from the black ice um i literally um so if you look at the black ice mx board support it's much smaller file because what it does is it actually extends um the ice core so if we look at the main class that represents the board here, I'm extending what I've already designed in the ice core. Yeah, and I'm just really adding connectors in this sense. So there isn't anything that magic in the Black Ice MX support because it leans heavily on what's already on the ice core. What it really adds on is the PMOD support. Uh, and really connectors here I mean it's all a bit confusing the way that they do um, the uh, signal naming if you like oh Laurie's been playing with Mygen today he's probably going to share me some of my mistakes then that'd be good anyhow so um, the connector is just a, a way of describing something that's repeated, i.e. common, so that you can uh, reuse. And it's really just an overlay of the pin definitions. So, for example, on Black Ice MX here, I've got P mods and mix mods. So it enables you, rather than the old PCF file, which is, let's just say, fairly basic, um, you can do some quite sophisticated abstractions to represent um, how you pass around the 
IO resources of your board. The IO resources primarily being the connections to your FPGA rather than just using pin numbers which is what's extensively used in you know PCF files when you're doing the Verilog side of things you can do something a bit more interesting um, here so what's Laurie saying now well you implemented a small CPU it has a horrible syntax <laughs> um, it has a horrible <laughs> syntax compared to what Laurie you mean compared to Verilog or compared to um, Spinal HDL which I know you love uh, I could understand if you're comparing it to Spinal HDL yeah I, I think I think it's a better syntax than Verilog in many ways Verilog is very tricky um, it's performant it's very good it's very descriptive um, particularly system 5 stuff but um, it is hard to tackle and it's very hard for new users to tackle very hard to get your head around Particularly if you come from a programming background you know all the number of times that I've tried to do tutorials with people from programming backgrounds uh, and introduce them to Verilog um, it's always been quite difficult because they carry certain assumptions certain language assumptions syntactical patterns that they recognize which break under Verilog quite quite quickly actually at least in something like nmigen or spinal hdl you've got something a bit more familiar in many ways and some of the tools that you may already be familiar with so from a programming background it's um it's probably a, a an easier learning curve um yeah so Laurie prefers the um spinal hdl syntax which is based on the scala language which in turn runs on java virtual machines jvms um the reason i've gone for nmigen here is because I want everything to be in Python to lower the learning curve. Um, I'm not going to cover or how we're going to join those two divides completely today, but theoretically you could have a single Python file that um, that covers both the model, the hardware model, and the um, algorithms that run both on the von Neumann and interact with the logic uh, which has a lot of advantages um, it means you can automate a lot of the stuff so in terms of not just being able to design the hardware parts but have that you know automatically uh, talking to the code that's running on in this case it's a hard processor but it can be a soft processor as well um, hence the um, Python direction so yeah sorry sorry Laurie I know you prefer your spinal HDL but that just it introduces another language that makes it harder in this particular case I need something a bit more unified this is about making it more accessible um, Python's got some advantages as well um, it's a great prototyping language um, right so where was I so if we go back to the black ice MX platform the only thing I'm adding here are connectors which are really if, if they're kind of like pin maps over the top of some existing resources so I can represent P mods and mix mods here um, very simply but everything else it kind of inherits from um, the ice core just using inheritance in this case class inheritance uh, you can see I've got the pinout information specified at the top here 
So um, let's just switch back to ice core because that's more relevant really at this point in time for us. Um, let's have a look at the structure of what we're creating here. Obviously at the top we're importing the necessary library functions and objects that we're going to need. Um, so the ice core in this case is actually subclassing um, the Lattice Ice 40 platform. So there's a load of common stuff that's required uh, when uh, NMIGEN is building um, uh, the hardware um, that is, you know, specific or maybe um, unique in some way to the ice 40 platform um, and at the top you have to define um, what the device um, code is now if you've ever looked at the make files etc I wonder if I can open one here show you let me see if I can open the make file. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can find. So if we look in um, Ice Core. At the examples we've got a very simple make file that we use for the Verilog example so if we look at blink for example uh, the make file um, we're actually specifying um, when we talk to Yosis we're passing in the um, the Verilog files that describe the HDO and then when we go to the routing we need to refer to what device that we're going to do the place and route it needs it needs that for that part of the journey so after the yosis part it needs to be optimized for that particular chip so it needs to know obviously in the very old case or whatever it needs the pcf file in our case we don't need that because we specify it in this uh, board file um, but we have to tell it what the um, which chip in the ICE 40 series this is. Okay, so we're doing the same sort of thing when we're looking at the ICE Core Pi because we're saying, ah, yeah, we're using this one. So that's specifying the which ICE 40 package we're dealing with here. Uh, which sorry, which device? on which package variant so when we do our um, alloy one we're going to change those okay the other thing it needs to know is what the default clock is so when when you're using nmigen it makes some assumptions um, in fact they're more like constraints you, you can override them um, it hides away some of the complexity that you may have between uh, synchronous and asynchronous parts of your your design um, so it, it chooses patterns default patterns that mean that you don't have to worry too much certainly in the beginning um, you don't have to deal with the clock domain it makes an assumption that it's going to be within a single clock domain to start with until you define extra clock domain so you need to provide it with a default clock signal for want of a better term okay then you have literally a list of resources now the give you an example of the sort of resources here the, the most obvious one is a clock you always need the clock resource unless you're using the PLL or internal clock source um, 
normally I've on 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 the MyStorm boards we always provide an external clock in where that's generated is irrespective at this point but there is an external clock coming into one of the pins of the FPGA so we have to define that because it is commonly used and we've defined the default clock at the top so we need to find what that is so there's this idea that you have a bunch of resources associated with this this board in MyGym so in this this case here what, what we're saying is we're, we're talking about this clock resource so basically here we're specifying what sort of IO it is so we're saying it's an input we're giving it a name uh, which is clock 25 at this in this example because it's a 25 megahertz clock um, we're actually putting the because it's a clock we actually have to tell it what frequency that is um, we need to define that so it knows what that means um, because it can use that later particularly when crossing clock domains for example if you've got more than one clock and then you've got things like your IO standard so in your PCF file here you may be specifying something like that or, or within the Verilog itself you may be using SP def definitions or whatever in order to um, talk about what kind of IO pin that is whether it's a more specialized function uh, that isn't say you know a standard 3 volt 3 C uh, CMOS it might be a differential pair or something like that for example or in more advanced uh, FPGAs it could be um, you know MIPI or something like that so that's a very simple resource definition now the next thing that we do resource wise here is uh, I this this creates a list effect, effectively of IO resources uh, which are the LEDs the individual LEDs and here you can see the pin numbers those LEDs so on the on the ice core board you know it's, there's there's four LEDs that can be driven directly dedicated LEDs if you like although you can reuse some of the pins for other purposes um, and then we're again standard LV CMOS but we're also adding pull up one on these uh, I don't know if you can remember but on uh, on the ice core we realized that in order to get a proper logic voltage range the LED even though they're active low LEDs with pull-ups effectively weren't allowing the voltage to go up high enough so um, turning the pull-up on means that you get still get when you've got the LEDs in there you still got a good transient that's logical zero and one in the outside sense, so I'm using the pull-ups on those. I'm also redefining the LEDs individually, so I can refer to them uh, in my Imagine by name. So rather than treating it as an array or list in Python, it would be like a, uh, a set of um, bits in Verilog. Um, I can also redefine these individually as one-bit signals or resources. Uh, again with directions here uh, and I'm pulling up so I'm doing exactly the same okay very simple I'm also saying that there's a couple of buttons and I'm associating those with the appropriate pins which happen to be multiplexed if you remember on the ice 40 with uh, uh, two of the LEDs then something else that was commonly used uh, on the ice core is the um, UR resource. So those pins go from to and from FPGA and the STM32 on an enabled UR port so that they can be sent up and down the USP in order to, you know, when you're running something in the FPGA that requires serial output you know like a CPU or a S5 or something like that uh, that just helps you connect that in so if you're doing a UART inside the FPGA you can use those pins to do that and know that that's going to be transmitted back up um, something else that we have here is SPI flash resources so these are the pins used to uh, connect to the SPI on the FPGA the ICE40 on the ICE core in this case um, 
We've actually got six of them because we can use quad SPI, not just SPI. Hence, we have the WP and hold pins included, uh, as well as, you know, the clock, mozzie, miso, and chip select. Um, we've got the SD RAM on the ice, ice board as well. Um, again, these are fairly standard ones, but again, I'm, I'm leaning on the support that's already in NMIGEN here. There is already a resource called SD RAM resource, so there's already basic support for SD RAM. Um, there was, however, a problem. I have to use a patched NMIGEN in order to do this because I'm setting the bank selector to none. Now, when that the original SDRAM resource in NMIGEN was written, the assumption was that you're already going to have you're always going to have a number of uh, banks. I, the assumption was you would never just have one bank you would always have a number of banks so here i'm setting the ba to none rather than setting it to a set of pins uh, and in order for it to accept that i had to go in and change the patch the end margin so that when it got none passed in rather than a list of pins or a tuple of pins or whatever you might want to call it in fact it's actually a a list of strings or a list of characters um, when it sees none that it does some exception processing and I've just changed that bit in the SD RAM part of NMIGEN so it will support that it just so happens that the chip that we use wasn't anticipated the larger ones were but not the not the smaller one that we have on the ice core um, the other thing I've got on here is obviously the SD card resource because there's an SD card on the ice store. So we've got all the basic resources that exist with an, you know, just to remind you, the ice storm there. And we're going to need to do something similar for uh, alloy. Hmm. The other thing that you have to do is you have to build in to this class uh, a function which is called, well, you don't have to, but if you want it to be useful, you need to add in uh, toolchain underscore program function. Um, what this does is it uh, enables you to actually, once you once NMIGEN has built, converted the abstraction into the primitives required for Yosis uh, and Arachne, etc., to create that binary chip file, the FPGA image, if you like, it needs to know how to get that onto the board. So, in the case of um, Black Ice and Black Ice MX and Ice Core. Uh, it's, it's exactly the same. What happens is um, it basically opens the bitstream file name output stream or opens a bit, uh, bitstream file stream output and creates a sub which it passes to a sub process uh, and it effectively just does a copy of that file that's been created to the serial port. So if you remember, if you look at the way that um, when we make or upload, um, just using the make files and Verilog, um, after setting up the serial port, we literally catalog, we cat out, we serialize the uh, bin file that's been created from the open source tools um, to the serial device because remember on something like unix or uh, linux you know uh, a serial device is just like a file so this is effectively doing the same thing it's copying from the image file that's been created by mmigen to the the file 
uh, description, the dev description, uh, virtual file name that represents the serial port. So it just literally serializes the uh, the bit file out to the serial port. Bob's your uncle. It's done. So um, what we're going to do with the alloy um, part isn't going to be that different from here. Um, instead of us sending serializing the bitstream to the serial port, what we will do is we will literally do a copy, a file copy, because the the way that because we're leveraging circuit python in this case uh, when the board is plugged into a machine a windows machine or linux or whatever what happens is the it comes up as a multiple usb device um, let me just show you can i show you uh, hold on Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can I show you this? Uh, yeah. Okay. We put this in front of the uh so if you have a look there in this case I'm using Windows so what you can see there is the file explorer hold on now when I plug this in what happens is it comes up as oh, circuit python d so it's it's uh there's several endpoints to the usb device one of which is a relatively low speed serial device which is used for the REPL python REPL or micro python REPL our circuit python repl and the other part of it it appears as a storage device and basically there is a driver running on the esp s2 32 s2 that is virtualizing the flash device that's attached to the esp32 um, to produce a, um, a file system so on there, you will see a number of different things, including the default code, you may be running any libraries that it needs, you know, the Python code, etc. But in this case, also we have a, uh, a binary file in there called, in this case, logic.bin. Um, the logic.bin file is what's looked for by the Python software that I'm writing in circuit Python. So when it sees that file changing, what happens is it then takes that that file and it actually reprograms the ICE 40 with that new bit file and then interfaces to it as required. So in our case, so if we just go back, page on here. So in our case, this copy, this subprocess of copying after it's produced the binary file is really just a copy. And rather than copying to a serial device file, um, we are si simply moving it across from one part of the file system to the other. Uh, in this case, it's the mounted file system that represents what's on the partition of the flash. 
on the alloy device itself. So it's really just a simple copy, um, which is kind of nice. It's a bit um, more intuitive than than you know streaming to a serial file, for example. Not only that, the fact that the serial device is separate from the file system and the image device just makes a, a cleaner separation, which is kind of nice. Uh, it stops things happening like you trying to send something over a serial device, which is a problem that we have on ice core that happens to have in it the signature that we're looking for that gets uh, interrupted by the writing process uh, because we've got effectively two separate um, USB parts or drivers in here. One which is responsible for moving the files across and one which is responsible for the UART effectively. There's a separate, better separation of concerns. So we're going to need to change that as well. So um, why don't we are there any questions, by the way? Because what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to start to uh, create that. So if you've got any questions, please do fire them away now. I'm going to just basically copy this for the moment. And then I'm going to create a new file in boards. It's at this level, isn't it? Um, and I'm going to call this uh, alloy so I'm just replicating what we already used here and then I'm going to start changing some bits and bobs. So first off, let's change the device because it's not a nice 40HX 4K. Um, let me just, oh, crikey. I think what we need here is, hold on. There's a way to get a list of these, I think. Um, hold on. What's the easiest way of getting this list? Uh, If I can run next PNR architecture specific operations, right? So I can copy these from uh, next PNR probably. Hold on, uh, I just need a list at this point. Sorry, bear with me a sec, folks. I'm just trying to get a list of the uh, architect chores.
Uh, yes, Laurie, they're done. I mean, you've got copies of them. The uh, ice core. I haven't put them into the repository yet. Um, crikey, I'm sure there's a list on here somewhere. Where is it? Um, package select device package default to oh ew ooh oh hmm Oh, I'm running the wrong one. Sorry, I'm being stupid. I'm running the ECP5. No wonder I can't find it. Silly me. So this uses the TQ144. TQ144. Uh, oh. hmm. Ice forty import. That's just a string, isn't it? Damn it. I think. I need to use that's what I need to use, I think. Package is, I think, is it just QFN48? Um, do I need to provide that? How do I get a list of the package? I think it's QFN48. So these are specific to the chip, obviously. Um, I hope it calls it QFM48. Ah, I don't get a list of packages. Is that possible? Yeah. Package. So what if I do next PNR ice 40 package? If I do Q F N forty eight, when it check that, yeah, it seems to like that. I think I'm going to stick with that. The rest I can keep the same. So in terms of pins, so let's move on and do the. Um, oh, I need to change the name. Nice core platform. Uh, I say alloy platform. Change the string associated with this here. All right, platform. Uh, I don't know, is that right? I need to check that URL in a minute. So Okay, um, this is going to change from my current Rev A to my current Rev B. In my current Rev A, I'm using, let me just check, because I made a, uh, a file 
for the demo verilog for this. Um, okay, no, where are we? We need a PGA tool. Oh, crikey, where is that? So I just realised I'm not showing you the um, right file. Apologies, you need to shout if I do that again, guys. Sorry. The file I'm looking for is a Verilog file or PCF. Of course, alloy blink and PCF. So eighteen pin eighteen. Right, in fact, let me just copy all of this because I'm going to need this. Just put that up here in the comments for the moment. Oops. So clock pin eighteen. Um I don't know, I could use the same here, twenty five megahertz. Okay, direction input oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll be doing five. Let's keep the speed the same. Um, LED resources. So in this case, the LED resources I only have three LEDs and not four LEDs. Um, if we do it in the same order as this, the one that I've got missing is the blue one. So let's just cut that out because we don't need that anymore. Um, we need. So I'm going to lose 49 there. So what are my PID numbers? So that's not blue. I think that's yellow. Is that correct? Let me just double check on something that I know uses all of them. Just in case I've got that wrong. There we go. Choose that instead. So we go red, yellow, green. Oh, it has to be in the reverse order, doesn't it? Here, so green is 39, uh, amber is 41, and red is 40. Same for these 39. Forty one and forty. Uh, I don't have a button on alloy, not connected to the FPGA. Let's get rid of that for a moment. There is a P mod, but I'm going to leave that for a moment. Don't use the UART. Uh, SPI flash. Um, hold on. There is. What was I looking at earlier? Oh, where is this? We have. Can I find it, Captain? Okay. 
I need to add an SPI in here. It's not a flash, but it is an SPI. Let me just use the icicle ones. Moment. Bear with me, I'm just going to bring up Eagle and get the pin numbers for this. These will change when we go to Rev B, obviously. So let me have a quick look here. Yeah, so um, in this case, right, CS, uh, hmm, 16, clock SCK is 15, Mozzie. 14 and my so 17 hold crikey uh, where did I put that I think it's no, two and one so it's I think it's 18 and 19 18 19 I'm just gonna leave that as flash for a moment that I'm gonna need to change that to um, Hold on, let me just double check. So it's WP and then but let's leave it at that for a moment. SD RAM we don't need. It's not connected to the FPGA. Neither is the SD card at this point. Right, okay. Um, the other thing that's slightly different here is using something called port at the moment. That should really be destination. Mm. Hang on. And a small A on a large A. It's caps. I put some bills in here. Draw. It's just a test. And I put one. So this is. Uh, port. So, port chain port. I'll leave port in there for a moment, but I'm going to probably rename that as destination or file name or something. Uh, it's not very descriptive, otherwise. Let's get rid of the eagle stuff. There we go. Let's just leave that as it is for the moment. Save that. Right. Okay. Let me just check a few things here. Okay, we don't need that anymore. Uh, 
FPS and hot spacing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that's fine. Save that. So, um, having done that, what I need to do now, let me just expand this. Um, check my notes. Can I do? Hmm. Where's the notes gone? I closed it. Ah, oh, yes. What was I doing? I need to do these two. Because I've now changed. Oh, I'm going to just imagine boards. My, where's my? Mm. Right place, why isn't it letting me do that? Let's say uninstall. Hmm. I don't quite understand that. Hold on. Sure, that's what I used to run. at least one requirement that uninstall options package requirements file Uh, could it be that it's already uninstalled it? Oh, yeah. Well, why didn't it say that then? I wonder if it's going to do that now. And then for an example. I've got an example here somewhere. Goodness, why have I lost it? Oh, that's blinky. So let's select all of that. 
let's create a new file Uh, here I want to have Android. Ooh, why isn't it like that? That's weird. Did I spell it wrong? Oh, it's because I use cat. No? What? Only, oh, it's only used, sorry, it's me. I'm not used to using this um, IDE. So this is going to stay the same. I'm going to use yellow in this case, right? And then I'm going to use alloy platform rather than uh, black ice. And instead of using that, I'm going to use Pikey. Right. Let me just remember, actually. Uh, what would that be? That would be. Uh, so I'm going T, won't it? Because I'm on WSL. Oh, no. What am I talking about? Only R and Mount C. Oh, this is going to be a problem because I'm running on Windows subsystem for Linux. And D is clearly not mounted. Um, bugger, hadn't thought of that. Uh, that's going to cause a bit of a problem. Uh, ooh. Hmm. <sighs> Damn it. Um, okay, let's just copy it somewhere temporarily on C, and then I'll have to manually copy it. That's a problem for it's because I'm running, I'm running the uh, nmigen stuff in Windows subsystem for Linux. Which mounts the C drive, but it clearly doesn't mount the um, D drive, which is where the destination we want, i.e., the device that's plugged in USB. So, hmm, um, that's a real pain. So I'm just going to move that over for the moment to somewhere on C. Uh, um, hmm, 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 hmm. Where am I going to put it? Word. Let's just put it in the temporary file area. Let's just put it at the top here. What are we going to call it? Um, temp. What's in temp? Let's use that for the moment, just to see if it produces anything. Copy. Oh, hadn't thought of that. Go. Oh. 
let's just put it in there. Um, and see what happens. Do I need a file name for this? Let's call it logical dot bin or logic dot bin rather. Oh, bin, not bin. Okay. So save that. Right, so what I want to do, I want to run this. I want to run I'm going to do uh, awesome. okay. uh, alloy link. Oh, is there two two dots in it? That is ah that's idiotic. Did I accidentally put that in? In fact. I can just rename it here, I think. Rename. If I remember. And then it should. Oh, how annoying! I thought there was a rename. No? What? Right. Save us. I can't believe I did that. Okay. Let me get rid of the old one. It's annoying. <sighs> so I need to do putting from um, do I need to run anything else? Um, I might need to do the notes. What do I do? Where do I just go? Minus P. I wonder if this will work. What happens if I run that? Okay, what does it like about this? Oh, because I'm passing in some connectors, maybe? Signal. Oh, we got them. Hello, 917. Type error. Can't instantiate abstract class. Ally platform with abstract methods connectors. What have I done here? What's different? Ally platform Is, Have I changed something about the constructor? What am I missing here? That's a really weird uh, type error. Uh, Ed, there probably is a, a way of mounting D. It's just, I don't know what it is. It might be. I'm not sure if it will be in the etc tabs file because it's dynamic, but um, yeah, at the moment I've got another problem to solve. But uh, thanks for hanging around, Ed. If you're off, um, we'll speak soon. Um, I mean, type, I can't instantiate abstract class and I platform with abstract methods connectors. What have I done here? Is it because I've used a cat? So I bet it's something daft like that. Hold on. Uh, 
connectors. Oh, I, maybe it's because I don't have any connectors. Hold on. Resource is equal. What have I done? What have I done here? Resource is equal. Uninstantiate abstract class that form of abstract method abstract methods connectors Cheers Ed, see ya. Uh Laurie, yes it's possibly why no connectors on the list, perhaps an empty list. Maybe I could just hmm. Uh, I'm trying to think because I would have thought that I did this before with the um, ice core. Uh, hmm. uh, let's have a look. So. Um, I still don't understand. It doesn't do that. Uh, that looked better. Oh, one minute. No. Oh, have I missed a comma here or something? Oh, it didn't like my um, sub-process that I've changed on here. Port. Because whatever I'm passing in and port, it doesn't like. Hold on, does it tell me what it's issuing here? Let's form itself script. Port, see that template logic there. Uh, does it not like that file name, perhaps? Mm. What happens if I try and create that? Touch. Uh -uh. Oh, what am I doing? What? Um, no. Right, I'm just being daft here. This is nonsense. Touch and okay. I'm struggling with this. Why isn't it let me do it? Oh, it's changed directly. No. God, it really shouldn't be this hard.
MNT C uses any word in migrant text. I wonder if I just do this. doesn't quite like doing that. Okay, what if I do this? Oh, this is rather annoying. Uh, Nine ninety eight. Uh, let me just check that is where it's falling over. Oh, wait a minute, of course, SH. Turn none, it's still sort of sub processed py. Hmm. Deeper than too far. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what I'm getting wrong here, folks. Uh, I'm passing in logic.bin. That's 18. That's calling platform build. Uh, that in turn calls this perhaps name port. Ah, I know why it's not working. I'm not reading the proper error list. Unsupported package QFN 48. That's why it's failing. Oh. Um. Hold on. Um, for it was a QFN forty eight. Okay. Let me just check. What did we have for the <sighs> ice core? We had TQ144. Okay. Um. And here we're using QFN forty eight unsupported package QFN forty eight. Um, I wonder if it's using the right. The right family, yes. My sporty platform. I wonder. Hmm. Could it be using Arachne rather than 
No, surely not. I must be using. It's got to be using um, Next PNR, not Lacme. What the hell could that be? Oh, let's cheat. Let's cheat. Let's look at one of the others. Uh, there's a whole bunch in here. Oh, and it well nigh under my gen. Trip under boards. Boards, 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 boards. Not test. No. Boards, here we go. Let's have a look under icebreaker's got the same chip, doesn't it? Uh, no, no, no. Can you see the SG from oh God. Of course it is, I remember now. Grr. I don't know why they don't use the standard um ones. How very annoying. Save. Right, so let's just reinstall that. Come on. Uh, oh, I did save that, didn't I? Uh, install. That looked better. Wow. Dear, a message a bit deceiving. It's only because I didn't look at the top of the bloody thing. Um, did that put a bin logic logic.bin file here? Look. That's what it's got. Doopy doop 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 doop. Okay. So it's built that by the looks of it. few minutes ago so let's just do a quick switch oh Sorry. so right now let me see if I can quickly um, can I pick up the camera you take the lens off Okay, hmm. this stuff's falling on the floor. Let me just dim the lights a little, guys. So at the moment, that's running trail. That's annoying. Couldn't come in across. On alloy. Hmm. There we go. So if I now copy this over... How am I going to copy it over? Ooh, that's so annoying. Uh, right, let's just copy it to uh, I don't know, Mount C uses A with Enmigen test. I know I can use a PowerShell to copy it. Let me just see. The So I'm just going to change into here. So I'm going to go um, copy it from uh, in my gen tests. No tests uh, logical dot bin, and I'm going to copy it to d colon slash logical dot bin so hold on let's just switch over here so you can see there it's running the trail on alloy I programmed it with I'm now going to try and program it by just simply copying that file from where it is currently um, in mmigen test where the file has been written because it could see that area and I'm going to copy it to um, to D colon slash logic bin. So what, what should happen is the LEDs will stop flashing as it gets programmed. And then hopefully it should flash just one of the LEDs.
Well, it certainly stopped. <laughs> it certainly stopped it flashing. <laughs> Oops, we got a problem, Houston. It did stop it flashing. Uh, the other thing I should quickly look at. Um, I'll come back to that in a sec. Uh, is the file. Do, 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 that's loading it. Just check I haven't done something stupid with that. Because it's entirely possible that I've changed that messing about. So I'm actually what I'm going to do now then is I'm, I'm actually going to the D drive to look at my loading file. You can see that logic bin has been copied there, look. But this is the Python that loads and writes the file. So it opens the logic.bin file here. So this is running on the in circuit pipe. Oh, it's working now. Look. It's working. Why was there a massive delay? That's really weird. Not quite sure what's going on there. I wonder maybe is this something to do with Windows subsystem for Linux file system not being up to date with the local file system. That's bonkers. Anyhow, it works. Ta da! So our NMyGem driver, our board file, is doing exactly what it should do. Although there's a few kind of bits of weirdness going on for some strange reason but I mean I, I, I can fathom those up another day right I've been streaming now for more than two hours and I'm sure most of you must be falling asleep by now um, so I'm probably going to call it a day um, uh, it's obviously doing what it should but I've got some issues to sort out there between the Windows subsystem for Linux accessing the uh, file system um, but I'm sure I can get that sorted thank you Laurie for saying well done <laughs> much appreciated um, so I need to get that sorted out but I'm sure that's that's relatively easy to do but anyhow it shows you in principle um, how we can get uh, mmygen working with alloy it's there I know it's only blinky but that you know from small seeds or small acorns uh, so um, if you've got any further questions on um, either the tile stuff that I spoke about earlier or any feedback on that or ideas or things that you think might be better ways of doing things let me know down on the forum um if there's any questions or anything about alloy that we've covered here in terms of the changes i'm making for the cad um or if there's any of the nmigen stuff that you have questions about that you'd like to uh, raise or you think there's a better way of doing any of the pieces that we've done here today again let me know um let me just post as usual the address of the uh, forum uh, UK. Um, if you're not already a member of the forum do um, do sign up also on Twitch if you get a chance please do follow me Folknology on Twitch the more followers I get following the stream the longer they let me keep my streams up which is um, kind of nice um, but yeah please do ask any questions or do any follow-up um, down on the forum um, and um, 
we'll take it from there i'm not sure what we're going to be doing next week i'm hoping to get the board designs off by the end of the week but i do want to do the other boards like the uh the tile carrier that holds alloy as well if i can get that done and get the tile designed get all the free boards ordered at once that gives me a bit of a head start on boards for a little bit because not only does that give me the next you know the rev b of alloy but it gives me um additionally a um uh some other stuff to work on in circuit python where we can start using nmigen to do um uh, sorry circuit python nmigen and the fusion of those two things start working on getting those working operating together and designing from a python top down approach uh, uh maybe work on something like a motion controller over the next um few weeks or something depending on how well we get on uh whilst we're waiting for the new boards and stuff to come um i do have some bits and pieces i can use here in the meantime to hook up uh, i've also got the uh the carrier boards I designed for testing. Um, we might be able to connect up some mixed mods, perhaps. It's a possibility next week. Anyhow, if you've got any suggestions, anything you want to see, anything you want me to cover next week, um, let me know down on the forum. Okay, guys. Well, I uh, hope you have a good afternoon or evening, depending where you are. Um, I'm just going to go and chill for a bit before I get some sleep. And I will either speak to you down on the forum or on Twitter at Folknology. Um, or see you in the stream next week. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Speak to you soon. Ciao.